How do you expect me to learn this if I can't even say it? So maybe I'm the one with inflammatory back pain now. Every time he walks in, he's like tiptoeing. It's just really hard for a first year. I need to go. What is going on you guys? Welcome back to the channel. And in today's video, I'm gonna be preparing for my progress test, which is on Tuesday. Today it is Saturday and it's currently just about 5 p.m. Hopefully in this video, you're gonna observe exactly how first year is approaching their studies towards the progress test. Countless students in the older years constantly tell me that the progress test is just so not important for years one and two, because the kind of questions do rely on you having some form of clinical experience, of which we have none of. And considering I have just finished all of my CCAs, I've finished my SEM test and the PEP presentation. I really don't have anything to do until Tuesday other than prepare for the progress test. Before we crack on with it, guys, if you are new here, hi, I'm Matt, I'm a medical student. I'm a first year if you don't already know. But I post videos to the channel every single week about my life as a medical student and things about productivity. So if that sounds like something that you wanna learn more about, hit that subscribe button and also hit the bell notification so you get notified every time that I post weekly videos and also follow me on Instagram because I post lots of just random stuff on there update my stories regularly and I also post a lot of informational reels on there as well let's get into the revision so I think the first step in figuring out exactly how to prepare for this progress test involved me reaching out to some of the older years guys that have done the progress test many times before and ask them what are the most high yield topics and the best way to go about approaching studying for a first year. And I got everything from just educated guessing, doing lots of the past papers online on OneMed, watching medical TV shows. I have watched Grey's Anatomy, but I'm not entirely sure how much that'll work with um, actual medicine. I've also heard that practicing your stats is gonna be really quite high yield and also not prepping at all. That's been another suggestion. I think we can discard that one. But at the same time, I do keep hearing that as a first year, your knowledge in clinical is really limited. I do think there is some value in doing past paper questions because you will tend to spot some kinds of trends and you might be able to narrow it down. But as well as this, I have been told that they do often include one or two questions here and there. For example, last year they apparently had some questions on statins and that was designed for, of course, the year one students and the year two students. So in that respect, the revision that we've done so far for the SEM test will actually be helpful in some way. My first step in planning for this exam has been, as always, building a little bit of a timetable, but I do only have two days. And fortunately, there are only four past papers, 2017 to 2020, to work through until the exam on Tuesday. Planning on doing 2017 and 2018 tomorrow, and on Monday, I'll do 2019 and 2020. I'm planning for the next hour and a half to just start going through the 2017 paper from one med, answering as many as I can do, and then working through the mark scheme. It is now 10 to five, and I do start work in about an hour and a half, so let's get into it. And so one hour later, I have just finished the 2017 paper to the best of my ability. I did it in Adobe, whereby I just highlight the a, B, C, D, or E, whichever one I thought it was. And I've also highlighted a few keywords, tests or drugs that seem to keep cropping up that I don't know about that I will read about after. But I am gonna mark this and see what I got. I definitely felt with this though, slightly more knowledgeable of certain things. I'd see a drug mentioned. And I remember previously in the progress test that we did in January before doing SEM2, these are words that I've never heard of. These are drugs that I've never heard of. So I actually was able to eliminate one by one a little bit better just because I kind of knew what some drugs did. Let's see what mark I got after I mark it. So out of the 49 questions, are you ready for it? I got 18 divided by 49, 37%. Um, I don't know how that makes me feel getting 30 7%. I think a good way of assessing exactly what that translates to is by looking at the grade boundaries for the progress test that we previously did. I can see that the grade boundaries actually show that an honours would have been over 37%. So actually in this test, I did get 
bananas. You know, it's quite reassuring. I could honestly say, I could confidently say whilst doing that paper, I probably felt like I knew 20% of the paper. There's a question here on pneumothorax and you can quite clearly see that there's a lot of air in his right lung. He's got um, pain in his right shoulder and increasing breathlessness. That, for example, is one that I'm quite happy with and I knew from the knowledge that I've learned so far on the course and I could answer that quite well. See, even some of these questions I would have thought I would have got right. So as you can see, question five, it's something to do with blood thinners and clotting. Now, I know that aspirin is a blood thinner and it's quite regularly prescribed. I just thought that that made most sense. I didn't realize it was a pixaban, which I do know is a direct oral anticoagulant and it acts on clotting factor 10. That's just an example, right? And you can see the five options that they give you. They're all like blood thinners and antiplatelet drugs. Even with my knowledge from the course so far, there's no way I could have done that. Right now in the course, we're not meant to be learning like the first line treatment, second line treatment. We just need to be learning the drugs, how they're indicated, what they're indicated for, and what their mechanism of action is. Uh, we got a chest x-ray here, and I knew that as well. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this because, you know, I could clearly see that this guy had chest infection. Um, he's had this for three days, cough and a fever, got a raised temperature, his pulse is on the higher side, blood pressure's normal, his respiratory rate is high. This is all quite evident of a chest infection. Well, I can see there that clarithromycin, it's a broad spectrum antibiotic. That for me felt like the right answer. Let's see what they described as being the justification for it. Okay, so he's got severe pneumonia with evidence of multifocal consolidation. He requires treatment with antibiotics first, so yeah. There we go. Question seven, what have we got here? I, I'm looking at these answers. I got it right. It was more on the scale of educated guess than it was like any kind of knowledge base. I can see that this is kidney related and kidney is SEM4, which is year two. So there's no way I'm gonna know this. This is about the investigations, the estimated glomerular filtration rate, which I can see is low and his urea is high, but his creatinine is also high. Now, I know the estimated glomerular filtration rate is somewhat, I guess, to do with the amount of blood flowing to the kidney. So that, to me, suggested that maybe he needed more fluids, more blood volume, and that's what I suggested. I, you know, there's no way I'm gonna know that. However, question nine, we can quite clearly see I got right and I'm really happy with this because again, this is from this semester. But yeah, I saw this question and I saw that we've got hypertensive here. We've got this patient taking benzoflumethiazide, which is a thiazide diuretic, amlodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, which is first line treatment for hypertensives, I believe. Ramipril ACE inhibitors, we've learned about that this semester as well. And atenolol, which is a beta blocker, which is used for patients with heart failure or um, angina. So which medication was most likely to be responsible for her presentation? You can quite clearly see from her investigations that her sodium levels are on the lower end, which is probably due to the thiazide diuretic acting on the sodium chloride potassium simple. And we can clearly see that benzoflumethiazide, which is a thiazide diuretic acting on the distal convoluted tubule, simple. So that's gonna prevent sodium reabsorption back into the interstitial fluid, into the bloodstream, and hence we can clearly see that this patient has uh, low sodium, and thiazide diuretics can cause hyponatremia. So yeah, this is like, look, this is like a really fun task because it's almost like a lot of the science that I've learned so far, doing these past papers are actually making me think, and it's like being asked a question about someone's investigations and seeing it, how it will be presented on, you know, on a patient's form. But it's quite evident that I do have quite a lot more um, practice to do on these practice papers and some reading around what I'm learning about. But guys, it is 6.31 and I start work very soon. So I'm gonna have to head off. I will catch you when I do some more work tomorrow on Sunday. So see you then. What is up? So it is 4 p.m. on Sunday and I have done very little work, to be honest. I've done an hour and 10 minutes. But what am I doing exactly? So I am currently going through the progress test that I did yesterday and making notes on the different questions. And the way that I'm doing that is anytime I come across a word, a drug, a term that seems unfamiliar, but it sounds like something that I need to know, I'm literally going on Google and just typing it in, learning a little bit about it, and I'm 
putting it all into a Notion document with toggles. So on each question, I've got various different words, various different drugs, various different topics, explaining exactly what that thing is. I'm very limited in what I'm doing, and I really don't know how well this is gonna to translate to the exam, but, you know, this is just a trial and error process. I'm just trying to figure it out as I go along, and hopefully this is gonna work in some way. Before I continue on, I need to have some lunch, even though it's 4.30. See what we've got in the fridge. Turkey pasta, had it for dinner yesterday. It's quick and easy. All right, so with lunch, I did a little bit more reading and I've actually come to the conclusion that I sort of now understand what clinical means. Like you often hear the older years always saying, yeah, so the progress test is very clinical as opposed to the semester being very like physiological. And I never really understood what that meant, but it's kind of clicked to me now having read through this progress test and the questions that I got wrong. So physiology in terms of year one and two were simply asked like, what is this physiological process? What is the receptor of this? What is the mechanism of action of this drug? The questions are a lot more specific, but when they ask questions that are clinical, it's sort of like you're having to work backwards. So this is an example, right? Question 34, it says a 26 year old woman has 12 months of back pain. It's the pain is improved by activity, but not relieved by resting. She finds it difficult to bend down during the day and pick things up from the floor. So which clinical feature is most specific for inflammatory back pain? You actually have to work backwards. You have to know that, okay, well there's inflammatory back pain and there's also mechanical back pain. Mechanical back pain is a pain that gets better with rest, but it's worse upon exertion. And it's also gonna be more prevalent in the older demographic, as opposed to inflammatory back pain, which might be more common in younger patients, like this woman, she's 26, and also it improves with exercise and it actually worsens with rest. So this, for example, you have to know the different kinds of back pain. You have to know when they most commonly present in a clinical setting. And then if you've got a patient that presents to you with you know, these specific clinical features, you've got to try and somehow figure out, okay, well, what kind of back pain is it? Which clinical features most likely fit that? And which is the most specific for inflammatory back pain? And now I'm starting to understand when people say, wow, year three is a huge step up. I'm starting to get that. Years one and two just seems to me like you've just got to learn the stuff. Yes, it's endless what you can learn, but hell of a lot easier than this clinical stuff. The reason that I wanted to give this as an example is I feel like this is the easiest example that I've come across because these clinical questions get a hell of a lot worse, like way, way harder. And that seems to be one that is like the best at illustrating what clinical style questions actually means. Anyway, I have done just about two and a half hours today and it's 20 past six. Where's the time gone? And why am I being so unproductive? I think the reason for it, if I'm honest, is this test doesn't feel like it is as important. And I just feel like there isn't a definitive way to study for this exam and plan for it. You know, I'm trying to hold on to the fact that worst case scenario, what could happen? and it's really not that bad. You know, you only need like 25% in this test to even pass it. It's not like the SEM test, which you feel like you know exactly what you need to revise to do well. And you can kind of gauge how well you're doing based on how much you remember and can answer the cases and the learning agenda questions. But another way in which these questions will get you is, you know, it's saying which is the clinical feature that's most specific for inflammatory back pain. And we've already established from the explanation that they've given that yes, the answer is improvement with activity, but also young age was an indicator that it's inflammatory back pain over mechanical back pain, but it's which answer is most specific. So I think this actually is a good indicator of when people say, yeah, but your exam's multiple choice. Yeah, but multiple choice. A lot of the answers are correct. All of those answers are correct. The five answers are improvement with activity. I don't know, when you got inflammatory back pain, is your pain gonna get better in, in the night? No, it's not. Radiation to the leg. Well, if you've got back pain, makes sense that you're probably gonna have some kind of leg pain. And morning stiffness in your back is common in inflammatory back pain, but stiffness during the day isn't. So it's like all of these answers make sense. And that is the story of our life 
when sitting papers in med school. Polymyalgia rheumatica. Polymyalgia rheumatica. Huh? Polymyalgia rheumatica. How do you expect me to learn this if I can't even say it? Polymyalgia rheumatica. And that's about as far as it goes when it comes to knowing what that means. All of this revision is kind of getting to the point where it's really hurting my back. So maybe I'm the one with if inflammatory back pain now, or mechanical back pain, or every kind of back pain. Oh. I wonder if at the end of this five year course, my posture goes from this to this. Wow, I'm really procrastinating today, aren't I? That's about three and a half hours done and I need a break. I also need some milk. It's a fun break on a Sunday. Let's do it. Weather's been so beautiful recently and I haven't been able to enjoy it at all, which is just life as a med student, I guess, but cannot wait to be finished. Milk and everything is so inflated in price. Absolutely ridiculous. Well, that was a lovely break, wasn't it? Quick trip to Tesco. Oh yeah, and also, inflation is scary. One pound 45 for a full pint bottle of milk. All right, let's get back to it. So I thought before doing this next test, I thought I might as well just procrastinate a little bit further and do my blood pressure. 136 over 73, which isn't surprising for me, at risk of heart disease and everything else, to be quite frank. Great for me, isn't it? All right, so I'm just working my way through another past paper here. And I find myself spending ages on questions that have like five drugs that I've never even heard of. Yet I still just find myself staring at the answers like, hmm, could it be chlorodiazepoxide hydrochloride? Or could it be chloropromazine? People could be making these words up and I'm still like, hmm, maybe it could be donopazil hydrochloride. Could it, couldn't it be? I don't know. I'm just gonna guess, because that's what we do, we guess. Okay, so I'm just in the process of marking this paper, and guess which question I got right? I guessed question 25 as haloperidol, and apparently it is the right answer, so just goes to show if you do guess, and you know. No, it wasn't even an educated guess, I just guessed. I got it right though, so I'm impressed with that. Alexa, what is atropine? Tropane alkaloid, an anticholinergic medication used to treat certain types of nerve agent and pesticide poisonings, as well as some types of slow heart rate. Radicardia. You can always count on Alexa, can't we? Okay, so I've just finished marking this 2018 past paper, and for this, I just got 20 out of 50. That means I got 40%. I'm really happy with that. Um, I definitely feel like I did a lot better on this, and I sort of try to use some level of educated guessing. Like if I'm to just walk you through a, a few things, for example, like for this first one that I got correct, this woman had pain in both shoulders, hips and thighs, very stiff on waking up in the morning. Well, based on the last paper that I did, that's something to do with an inflammatory pain, I'm assuming. And considering her C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker is high, that makes me think, hmm, okay, well, we're gonna, give her a steroid. So that's why I thought the answer was E, prednisolone, and that was the correct one. I'm not really sure about erythrocyte sedimentation weight. We've not learned that, so I don't know. This is a stupid one that I should have got right. I actually did put carboxyhemoglobin, but I forgot that carbon monoxide forms carboxyhemoglobin. I was thinking, no, that's a trick question because carbon monoxide forms carbon monoxyhemoglobin. So I was like, nope, it's not that. That's a trick question. And I just thought, okay, well, anaerobic respiration because they're in anaerobic conditions. I just thought I'd press lactate. Uh, yes, this one here, I was really impressed with this one. 65 year old woman had a mechanical aortic valve replacement and coronary revascularization. She has been treated with daltiparin and aspirin, which is a blood thinner. 
What is the most appropriate long-term patient management? Now, having done the previous exam, I remember it actually said that long-term treatment is with apixaban or warfarin. Now, in the last question, warfarin wasn't an option. So that's why the answer was apixaban. So this kind of threw me off because they were both options. So this was like a 50-50 guess. I knew it was one or the other, and that's why I went for warfarin. So I did narrow down my options. Prospective cohort, this is just if you know stats. You need to know your stats, to be honest. Uh, next up, we have this fella here. He drinks a lot of alcohol, his abdomen is soft, and his ferritin is shockingly high. Now I know that transferrin is the molecule which is the protein that takes iron around the body. So I thought that if his ferritin is high in his blood, maybe it's not binding to the transferrin. So that's why I selected that. Yeah, so for this one, this isn't actually something that we've done yet as well. We've not done arthritis, but I just thought 72 year old woman, she's on the elderly end. So it could be, you know, something like arthritis and she's had it at the base of her thumb, but no other joints are painful. So this told me that, okay, so it's not rheumatoid because I know that that's a, autoimmune disorder where it's an inflammatory response of your body reacting to potentially all the joints. So that, that wouldn't be more of an issue in other joints, but the fact that she's only got it in one and she's an elderly lady, that tells me that it's probably osteoarthritis. And I was correct. So I'm happy with that as well. Oh, and conductive. I love this question because I'm actually deaf in one ear. So I saw that and I was like, I did a dissertation on this for my undergrad. So I'm aware of what sensory neural is, what conductive is, how you test for it. That was just the benefit of my undergrad. And actually this one, I like this question as well because I recognize these things. I just remembered that community acquired pneumonia um, is most commonly gonna be the strep types but hospital acquired is generally Pseudomonas and Staphylococcus. Now in this, it doesn't really give you much of an indication. This person has a temperature and he's got a tender ankle and he's got some swelling. So I just did think there was gonna be some kind of infection, some kind of bacterial infection. It doesn't say anything about him being in a hospital. So that just made me get rid of the C and D options and I just went for strep. So yeah, I mean, look, I've gotten honours for this. I didn't get a distinction according to the grade boundaries of the previous test. But, you know, it does just go to show that you can narrow down your answers and do more of an educated guess. So whereas there are five options, by knowing your stuff to some extent, you are giving yourself maybe by narrowing it down, sometimes a 50% chance if you can narrow it down to two, but also obviating the ones that seem like most irrational. And I think that's the best way to go about approaching this progress test. But definitely having done a paper prior to this, it's put me in a much better position. Some themes came up a bit more and I'm definitely looking forward to do the next two progress test papers to prepare. So yeah, good result overall. And it is just about quarter past 11. And as I'm eating, I am gonna go through the rest of that paper and just write notes on it. Just see what I can gather from this paper. But also for dinner, I decided to stick on some chicken goujons in the oven from the freezer. And yeah, look at the state of that. Quick and easy. I have to use these sauces to make them worthwhile. But, you know. We move and I need to get on with more revision and more preparation for this progress test. So I'm gonna crack on now and eat this at the same time. All right guys, I have done six hours and 15 minutes today, which isn't the most work, especially considering I got an exam in two days. I, just, I don't know, I just lack the motivation a little bit. And I'm on question 17 of reviewing this 2018 paper. I was hoping to get through the end of 2018 today. That's not gonna happen. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna have to try get through as much as I can tomorrow. So on that note, good night. Good morning guys, it's 11 a.m day before the exam and of course to start with I definitely need a coffee I've been going to bed really late and that's why I'm waking up at the time that I've woken up at and I don't feel great about it I do feel tired <sighs> but let's get a coffee and the weather is absolutely shocking today but I massively prefer revising when the weather's like this outside just because I don't feel guilty 
about not getting out in the sun. Okay, plan today. Finish off reviewing the 2018 paper and then sit the 2019 and 2020 paper and do the same for those. Got my coffee and I've also got my Magic Mind, which I've been trying out recently. It's got matcha in it and it's got loads of different ingredients that are apparently going to help me focus more. And I will also be including this in an advert on my main channel, which if you guys aren't following, you need to follow and check out. Click on the card up there. I'm gonna taste that. Mm. Helps you relax, gives you energy, keeps you focused, makes you happy. Love it, herbal supplement. All right, let's do it. All right, it is 3.30 and I've only just managed to get through the end of reviewing this 2018 paper and just writing some notes on it and just clarifying some terms, some medical jargon that I wasn't familiar with. I'm just not sure how much of this I'm actually retaining and how much I'm really going to remember because it does rely on active recall for you to remember things. And I'm not really doing active recall here. I am just kind of building notes. So maybe it's not gonna be that helpful in hindsight, but for now, this is what I'm doing. I'm gonna get on with 2019 paper and 2020 paper, and I'm gonna make it my business to finish both of those by the end of today, but it's time for some lunch. And for lunch, I've got this vegetable stew that my mum cooked with some Parmesan style dumplings in there, which are absolutely delicious. And I'm gonna have some protein bagels with it. And I've also added some Parmesan on the top just to make it have a little bit more protein. All right, so I have just finished marking my 2019 paper and the result that I got out of 50 is 22. I've just gradually increased my score on both of these tests with the more like revision that I've done based on the mark schemes and doing a bit of reading around it. First test, I just scraped the boundary. The second one, I got 40% and on this one, I got 44%. And to be honest, on this paper, there were some questions that if I hadn't have done the previous past papers, I wouldn't have known. So first of all, steroids seem to be used very frequently. That's like one of the main things that I keep seeing. The second thing was, I just remember reading nephrotic syndrome and I noticed that the ankle edema, the swelling in the limb is one of the hallmark signs of it. So I noticed that um, I got it right. And yeah, another thing that seems to keep coming up is stats. So definitely know your stats. Another one, there was uh, an Afro-Caribbean man. He's got high blood pressure, but he's 52 years old. And I just remember from the hypertension lecture series that we were doing, the first drug to use in an Afro-Caribbean individual is a calcium channel blocker. And lo and behold, the option of Amlodipine is there, so I selected that and got that right. So I was buzzing about that one. Really, really happy with this result so far. I should be on track for this honors in this progress test from this preparation. So if you are watching this wondering how to best prepare for the progress test, I'm starting to realize that one of the best things that you can do is every time that you come across a new condition, a new disease, a new test, a new screening that you are not familiar with, you've never heard of before, just Google it. And with that, when you do the test, it will help you in the process of elimination. Because let's say a patient says that she's not reported her hearing changed, but she has experienced vertigo, that you know you can redact the option of Meniere's disease because that is characterized by ringing sensation in the ears. And so, it's very fast approaching dinner time, 9.30. I eat very late, but I'm gonna have chicken breasts with Nando's bag in a bake. Three chicken breasts inside the bag, in the oven, 30 minutes, Bob's your uncle. And so whilst that is cooking in the oven, and the potatoes are boiling. I'm gonna continue on with this paper, this 2018 paper, and then hopefully have time to mark it. Right, 
so I have just finished marking the 2020 paper and the result that I got for this one was 18 out of 50 which means the mark for this was in fact 36 percent this paper was significantly harder primarily because it was a lot of kidney which we've not done any of so there are a few reasons why you know on this test I didn't perform quite so well but regardless I do think my performance has been pretty consistent and you know I'm hovering around the high 30% 40% mark so regardless I do feel like I have done a good amount of preparation and I do feel like I am in a good position now to sit this exam tomorrow having done this preparation and look who has decided to show up at midnight what time did you call this, Matt? What time did you finish work? Uh, about 11. Finished about 11. So you didn't maybe just try to avoid me before you came in? <laughs> he actually finished it. Like he actually finished it. He <laughs> been at the park since. <laughs> <laughs> in the park. Just sat there yeah. in the park hoping that I would have gone to bed. Every time he walks in, he's like tiptoeing and then I, I open the door and I see him. It is 20 past 12. Is it for you? You off to bed? Yeah, I am. I'm off to bed, so I will catch you guys in the morning. Good morning, guys. It is the day of my exam and it is 20 past nine. I need to set off. Like, my exam's at 9.45. Um, I've just spent this morning just looking over this past paper from last night. I'm just having some breakfast as well. I didn't sleep good at all. I just was rolling around. I had about six hours sleep, which isn't good before an exam. It is my last exam and I am so excited to get this over and done with. I'm gonna eat this and aim to set off in about five, 10 minutes. So I'm gonna continue reading through this past paper. Alexa, what time is it? It's 9.22 a.m. I need to go. I'll see you at the exam. Right, we're gonna get there in time. Why did I think this would be a good idea? I do not advise arriving at the last minute to an exam. Because now I'm a little bit anxious. But I didn't need to be. But I will see you guys after the exam. Wish me luck. And three hours later, I'm finished. I've done my progress test and I'm finally free for summer. That test was so hard though. Guys, wow. I literally cannot believe it that I have just finished first year of medical school. Like that's all the exams over and done with. That exam, let's talk about that for a second. Really hard. It is, it's just really hard for a first year. So much clinical application and there's only so much you can get from doing past papers. You know, even when you are recognizing questions that might be in some way similar, they have changed it so that the drug, drug of choice or the treatment or the uh, screening test of choice or the protocol that you'd follow is completely different. That progress test, you are time constrained. Um, I think a challenge is really just having the self-discipline to read through a question, try and understand what's being said as quickly as possible. And if you don't get it as a first year, you just need to move on to the next one. Because I did find myself for the first half of the paper just trying to figure out things even though I had no idea about any of the answers. But definitely doing past papers under time conditions will leave you in a good position. It will make you become more accustomed to that kind of reading the clinical presentation quickly and then just selecting an answer. But anyway, there you have it. That is the end of first year and the end of how I prepared for this progress test. So I really do hope this video has in some way been helpful to you in planning how you're gonna revise for your progress test. That is basically it for this video. So if you have enjoyed it, hit the like button and also subscribe if you are new here and also hit the notification bell so you get notified every time I post weekly videos to this channel. And also follow me on Instagram. The link is right there and it's in the description. But as always, I will see you in the next one.